Shalom, everyone. In the Nazarim, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. My name is Lou White, and I'd like to discuss with you today a topic on the, t it's on the subject of evolution, but it's going to be from a little different tilt, and it's going it, to evolution versus intelligent design. But we're going to look at it a little bit differently, and we're going to make an appeal to the one atheist that is listening or watching this that might just be wanting to get a little proof. He's always wanted that proof. At one time or another, almost every atheist has yearned for someone to prove that there's a creator. All they have to do is just have, have some proof. Uh, but after asking all the men they know about it, and all the smart men and maybe not so smart men, there's one person or being that they have not asked. And you know who that is. If they would ask the one that they don't believe exists, maybe he would answer them. Well, actually, this presentation is going to, in part, present to you his response to your unbelief. And so you should listen, because he's been listening to everything you've been saying as an atheist. Every word that's come out of your mouth and every thought that's gone through your head, he's listened to them. But it's time for you to listen to what he has to say in order to be fair. Because in Proverbs 18, for example, we have some wisdom. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. So you should listen. So he's listened to you, and Yahuwah, the creator, actually, he believes that you exist, so why don't you believe that he exists? It's only, it only stands to reason. So listen to what he has already said long before you were ever born about this topic. And I've hunted some things down in his word, that actually addresses you. Why would he do that? Because he cares. He knew you were going to hunt for him. And I want to mention this too. Not only did he speak of you, but he has power in his word. His word has creative power. Because see, the word of Yahuwah itself it has creative power within it. So if you listen to his word, even in a translation, it's got power in it, and you'll recognize that power. When he spoke the Hebrew words, Haya or, he said, let there be light, or let light come to be. And the light that we're going to reveal to you is the light of men, the light that, that comes into men and enlightens their minds and enables them to know Yahuwah. You cannot know Yahuwah unless you receive that light, and that light is a person. And you're going to experience that, that one atheist that's watching this. Now, listen to this. This is about that light, that, me, that man that was sent into the world that you know as J-E-S-U-S, -S, but his real name is Yahusha. Isaiah, or Yeshiyahu 49, verse 2, says, And he made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he hid me and made me a, a polished shaft. In his quiver, he hid me. And this is basically going to be like an arrow into your heart because you're going to receive him and know that he really does exist. Now, in the seminar, we're going to use these terms, and I just want to familiarize yourself with them. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube or a DVD, you'll be able to read this through more carefully, but we'll just glance at this. The traditional terms like Lord, we're not going to use. We're going to use his real name, and that is yod He ua He Yahuwah. And the word Lord, of course, is a translation into English from a Hebrew word, B-A-A-L. We wouldn't want to call him that. Now, J-E-S-U-S, we're going to call him Yahusha, his real name, which is Yah is our deliverer. And we're not going to really need any Greek at all, although we might use one or two Greek words and explain them. But we're going to go back into the Hebrew. And we're not going to use the word G-O-D. In place of that, we're going to use El or Elohim. And the uh, 
term Jews, for example, is actually a tribe, Yehuda, and that is, uh, the plural is Yahudim, and it means worshipers of Yah, and they're one tribe of 13, technically. And Christians are, uh, that word is used three times, I believe it is, in the, in the Brith Kadeshah, or the New, New Testament, as they call it. That's actually a term that, that was a term of scorn, and if you read it in context, you'll see that it was a term of scorn Christianos. And it is derived today in the word Cretan. And the real name that we called ourselves, and we were being called, like in Acts 24, verse 5, is Nazarene, the branches, or the watchmen. And uh, we are guardians of his name and his word. Now here, it, we're going to start off with, for the atheist, this is going to be a little tricky, but uh, just, just bear with it because you, he's listened to you, so listen to him and see if there's anything good here at all. This is a covenant of love. Here is the retelling of the covenant for the scattered tribes of Israel in the last days, and it's given at Deuteronomy 5. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of which is in the heavens above, or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. Number three. You do not cast the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to ruin. For Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. Number four, guard the Sabbath day to set it apart as Yahuwah, your Elohim, commanded you. Six days you labor and shall do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah, your Elohim. You do not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your ox, nor your donkey, nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah, your Elohim, brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah, your Elohim, commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. And that's the covenant sign given in, in, in uh, Ezekiel chapter 20. Now, I want to point out in Exodus or Shemoth chapter 20 that there's a little difference in that commandment. And this is the reason why evolution has become so prevalent because we've forgotten our creator. Because the, the sign between us and him is a remembrance of the creation itself. Remember the Sabbath day to set it apart. Six days you labor and shall do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah, your Elohim. You do not do any work. You, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For, or because, in six days Yahuwah made, that's created, the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore, Yahuwah blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart. He blessed the day. The day is still blessed. In pointing out the correlation here in Revelation 14, in verse 6, it says, And I saw another messenger flying in mid-heaven, holding the everlasting good news to announce to those dwelling on the earth, even to every nation and, to, and tribe and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear Elohim and give esteem to him, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made the heaven and the earth and sea and fountains of water. You see that? It's a reflection of what, what's in that commandment. Now, number five, respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you so that your days are prolonged and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you. Number six, you do not murder. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, 
You do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And number 10, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. And then continuing along into chapter 6, Hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. And these words, which I am commanding you today, shall be in your heart. And you shall impress them upon your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. That's Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. I was uh, reading something recently about Lot's cave at the southern edge or region of the Dead Sea. And there's a place down there in the region called Zura. And there's literally hundreds of graves there from a community that lived there. There were synagogues and Christians living there. <clears throat> and on these gravestones, there's a, a term at the very bottom of the, of the Israelite gravestones that says Shalom and then El Yisrael Shalom. Now that would say peace be upon Israel, peace, you know. And uh, I thought that was an amazing thing. Lot's cave is a, a place where it's said that he went there with his two daughters when he was fleeing Sodom. Now, let's get started on the process of understanding the difference between evolution and whether it's true or whether it's a, a lie or a myth or a fairy tale, and, or if there is actually intelligent design behind something, especially in the processes of life. They say that the DNA strand is so complex, and, the, and then there's a host of other auxiliary things that go on around that, and then embedded within that, there's more. And there's layer upon layer upon layer. And if you removed even one of those layers, that the whole thing would just wor not work, you know. In the process of Satan leading the world to believe that he doesn't exist, the world is led also to believe that Yahuwah doesn't exist either. But remember, Yahuwah believes you exist. <clears throat> there's always been a stronghold of thought denying Yahuwah's existence. Um, because you have to diligently seek him and he will allow you to find him because he's waiting and pleading for you. It's like standing in front of a tree and denying that there's a forest because you're so close to the tree you can't see the forest. He's right there. Evolution versus intelligent design. Is there a designer or is there not? The fool in Psalm 14, the fool has said in his heart, there is no Yahuwah. They have done corruptly and they have done an abominable deed. There is no, no one who does good. So uh, even a heart that rejects truth is aware because your conscience knows and you're seeking him and you wish that he did exist, but you've got to try hard. The belief or religion of evolution is summed up in this little cartoon that I created. But remember, every, every atheist would agree that religion has been a cause of great terror on this planet. This is not religion. Yahuwah has nothing to do with religion. So that's one of the strongholds you have to overcome too. This is about overcoming strongholds, which are thought prisons. See, you're in a box and you can't get out unless you open your mind. Now, here's a little fellow that's saying, okay, so if your interpretation is true, absolutely nothing at all blew up a very long time ago, and then by random interactions developed intricate design and order. And then through a series of even more random accidents, some of it managed to self-replicate and became conscious of its existence. Essentially, that's what I believe. That's basically what an atheist believes and an evolutionist would believe. Now, then the little fellow on the, on the left says, so where did the non-physical life come from? Oh, and then the adversary over here says, you mean spooks? Well, that's easily explained. 
I don't believe in spooks. Well, he means the spiritual realm. But uh, Psalm 10 says, In the pride of his face, the wrongdoer does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no Elohim. Now, you see, I mentioned earlier that Yahuwah has already addressed you as an unbeliever and an atheist or an evolutionist. He already knows that you're there. He's already t spoken to you. What other writings of, the, of spiritual matters, a reality really is what we're talking about, has ever had the creator of whatever they're worshiping speak to you that way? See, this is the real creator wants you to look for him. He knows that you, you're there. So he's addressing you. Now, this belief system that we call evolution is not a science. It's a belief. It's a theory. It's like, well, it might be this way. It might be that way. And if you can wrap your mind around it, it doesn't make it true. It just means that you can understand the process of it, but it doesn't have any proof of its existence. But believing in evolution will not make it come true. If you believe it is, just because you, you can believe whatever you want, but that doesn't make it right or true. Uh, on February 11th, or on the second Roman month, I should say, I, could, I shouldn't even say that word because that's a pagan deity's name, sorry. Uh, 2009, on Darwin's birthday, only four out of 10 people believe in evolution. As hard as they try, trying to program us with, oh, 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs died, or they were walking the earth, or whatever. And uh, 360 million years ago, uh, something happened, and a tree walked out of the ocean and planted itself onto the land, or whatever. Or it, a spore came out of the ocean and started all the vegetation. There's more vegetation in species numbers than animals. You know, there's more speciation, you know, in the... And you hardly ever hear about all the plants, but the plants and the animals we're going to see are in a symbiotic relationship. Just like males and females have to both exist in complete oper operable condition in order for a child to come about. Because two roosters can't make a chicken. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> just like that, the plant and animal kingdom, uh, they both have to be in existence. You know, but. In Princeton, New Jersey, this poll was released on the eve of the 200th anniversary of Charles Darwin's birth. A new Gallup poll shows that only 39% of Americans say they believe in the theory of evolution, while a quarter say that they do not believe in the theory, and another 36 don't have an opinion either way. So the belief is really not that strong. Now, plants and animals, symbiotic, relationship. That's, that's where without, without both of them working together, neither one of them will survive. These are life systems. The fern is a plant. It has a nice little delicate leaf operation there going on. And it has more chromosomes than you would ever believe. The human being has 46 chromosomes. 23 come from the man, 23 come from the woman. But the fern this one, the Ophioglossum, has the highest chromosome count of any known living organism with 1,262 chromosomes. That's, the chromosomes is, is where the DNA is embedded. Now, in comparison, most species have far fewer chromosomes. And as I said, humans have 46. They're among Earth's oldest known plants. And it says in a quote from... Wikipedia that I got, it says the first ones, the first ferns, lived about 260 million years ago, which we're not buying that. That's what they say. But they do admit and they, that they look just like the fern that is growing today. Now, if they really believe that 260 million years have passed and these ferns that lived back then look exactly like the ferns today, then that's saying that they're wrong on several levels because, first of all, they did not evolve into anything else. They're still the same. And the 260 million years is way off because it's only been around 6,000 years. Uh, because you, here's another interesting thing, too. On the fifth day of creation, now this is Yahuwah's words, not mine, he created all the plants 
and that produced oxygen. Now there was a natural, obvious atmospheric carbon dioxide level, because you know that that was a, a, a st it was a, it was a, a quantity that was just sufficient. But there were so many plants created that day that they created a lot of oxygen as a byproduct for the next day, so that the animals wouldn't get created and then and then die of asphyxiation, you know. Because you see, he had the oxygen isn't something that's just out there by itself. Um, carbon dioxide comes out of volcanoes too, you know, but oxygen doesn't, you know. I'm talking about free oxygen that we can breathe, you know. So on the sixth day, the animals were created and they could breathe the air because the plants were created the previous day. And the plants just suck up carbon dioxide like candy and they make it into oxygen and carbon, which is the wood, you know. So carbon dioxide is vital for our existence because if we didn't have it, we wouldn't have any wood, we wouldn't have any plants, and we wouldn't have any oxygen. So, you know, hip hip hooray for carbon dioxide, you know. <coughs> Don't worry about it. it. They say it's a greenhouse gas, but greenhouse gases are good things. Uh, <coughs> The main, the primary greenhouse gas is water vapor. Now let's let's see what uh, Yahuwah has to say in Psalm 139. He says, "I give thanks to you, for I am awesomely and wondrously made." That means He was created. Wondrous are your works, and my being knows it well. My bones was not concealed from you when I was shaped in a hidden place, knit together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body, and in your book all of them were written, the days were for, they were formed, while none, of the, none was among them. So Yahuwah knows uh, all things, and he sees the things that are going on in the secret places. So now, let's look at evolution theory, uh, and of course they'll deny this, but is it a religion according to the definition? Yes, it is. It's a faith-based religion, that's what it is. Now, in, uh, it, as a noun, it's in the dictionary, a noun of, for the definition of a religion is a set of beliefs, a set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe, especially when considered as a creation of, of a superhuman agency or agencies, usually involving devotional and ritual observances and often containing a moral code governing the conduct of human affairs. Well, we can address all of those things because they may not have you know, the same rituals that religions do, but they do have their educational places where they go and they worship their science that they call, uh, they call it a science. It's really not a science, it's a religion. But they, uh, in fact, they're every bit as fanatical about it because if one of their scientists says, well, look at this, I think we're uh, going to have to look into this area, they, they pull them back from that because if it has anything to do with creation, then they treat them like they're heretics. They'll fire them. You know, they'll cut their funding. The universe in evolution theory is believed to have been created by itself. <laughs> okay. Uh, not questioning where the singularity came from that blew up. They say that a black hole blew up. It is believed that an infinitesimally small singularity blew up and then randomly expanded and formed all space and all time and all energy. Now here's a, a little graphic presentation which a lot of people will see done in different ways. But let's say that we have the unknown frontier of all knowledge, and then we have, an, within that, we've got all knowledge that everyone has ever acquired about the universe. And what any one individual might know would rep be represented by this little speck. I mean, any one person can't know all knowledge, and it certainly can't go out into the unknown frontier of knowledge because that's not accessible to anybody. So is it possible for a person to acknowledge that he may not possess the knowledge of the creator unless that person pursues that knowledge? So what we're trying to make you think about is after all the time that you've spent 
saying, nope, he doesn't exist, and here's why. He's listened to you, so listen to him. It's your turn to listen. Now, working parts in living systems are not processes that accidentally built them. In other words, if you have an operating part in a living system, it didn't just start creating other processes, you know. So where there is a design, there is logically a designer. Now, in the book of Eob, or Job 38, it says, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Now, look at these faces on this thing. This is a, a famous place, and uh, we're seeing these rocks formed into human beings' faces. Not just human beings, but specific human beings. Now, is it possible that somehow, accidentally, the universe created or formed this face, or any one of these faces. These are, re these are pictures or, or carvings on rock. And if you believe that, now, if you could believe that, that, uh, that a human being, the human being could be assembled by the universe, then this is much simpler, because that human being is much more complex than these rock faces are, you know? It's unbelievably more complex. Now, uh, we have in Romans chapter 1 a record written down by a man named Paul, and he's talking about the suppression of truth. And that's really what evolution is. It's a process that's employed in order to suppress truth. And here, read these words in that context. For the wrath of Elohim is revealed from heaven against all wickedness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is, is known of Elohim is manifest among them for Elohim has manifested it to them for since the creation of the world his invisible qualities have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made both his everlasting power and his mightiness for them to be without excuse because although they knew Elohim they did not esteem him as Elohim nor gave thanks but became vain in their reasonings, and their undiscerning heart was darkened. So the darkness that you're living in as an atheist and the hopelessness that you have can be rectified if you just turn your head up and look up and say, oh, I may have been wrong. Because the dying words of many atheists have, have been, I think it was Winston Churchill, he said, I've been such a fool. Because you don't want to be there, you know. Now, Romans 1, 22, 27 continues. Uh, Claiming to be wise, they became fools and changed the esteem of the incorruptible Elohim into the likeness of an image of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed beasts and of reptiles. Therefore, Elohim gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to disrespect their bodies among themselves, who changed the truth of Elohim into the falsehood and worshiped and served that which was created rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Because of this, Elohim gave them over to degrading passions, for even their women exchanged natural relations for what is against nature. And likewise, the men also, having left natural relations with women, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing indecency and receiving back the reward which was due for their straying. And continuing in verse 28, And even as they did not think it worthwhile to possess the knowledge of Elohim, Elohim gave them over to a worthless mind to do what is improper, having been filled with all unrighteousness, whoring, wickedness, greed, evil, filled with envy, murder, fighting, deceit, evil habits, whisperers, slanderers, haters of Elohim, insolent, proud, boasters, divisors of evils, disobedient to parents, without discernment, covenant breakers, unloving, unforgiving, ruthless, who, though they know the righteousness of Elohim, that those who practice such deserve death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Anyway, all the way back to Shinar in the building of the first city, the great city in the kingdom of Babel, men have sought to rule themselves and they leave Yahuwah out of their plans. You know, in the media today, you hear all kinds of 
things happening in the world and oh this terrible storm that earthquake and this is something that happened th just a few days ago to the north and the south of us and I saw that as a shot across the bow because we could have lost tens of thousands in this city 38 people they say died in these storms that swept across over a thousand mile area and uh, we could have lost tens of thousands of people or more a hundred thousand because there's a million people living in this metropolitan area and this was just a few miles out of town north and south yeah. you know <clears throat> And, and even in spite of that, you hear the media saying, we're so thankful, we're so thankful, we're so thankful. Thankful to who? See? Now, a scientist comments on intelligent design. He, he, this is a molecular biologist's words, who identifies genetic controls for diseases. And he states this, creation design. It's like an elephant in the living room. It moves around and it takes up enormous amount of space, loudly trumpets and bumps into us, knocks things over, and eats a ton of hay and smells like an elephant. And yet, we have to swear it isn't there. That's because they live in the cathedral or the religious house of their religion. That's where they are. They're in their, in their cathedrals, their institutions, their uh, educational places, museums, universities, high schools. Now, here's, here's a description for you atheists about day one. In Genesis, or Bereshith chapter one, it says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, and the earth came to be formless and empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of Elohim was moving on the face of the waters, and Elohim said, Hayah or, let light come to be. And light came to be. And Elohim saw the light, that it was good. And Elohim separated the light from the darkness. And Elohim called the light Yom, or day. And the darkness he called Lila, night. And there came to be evening, and there came to be morning the first day. Bereshith, Elohim, Bara'at, Hashamayim, Uat, Ha'aretz. Those are the first words of the scriptures. Barashith, Elohim. Now that's saying that Elohim created it. That's what it's saying in that phrase. Now ignoring Yahuwah is the same as denying him. It's denial. It's just an obstinate thing. You've locked him away. You've said, no, I don't want you. I don't want to know you. But I'm inviting you and appealing to you to look and see that he is good and he does exist. Now, if you live as if Yahuwah isn't there, it's the same as denying his existence. Matthew 10, verse 32 starts out saying, Everyone, therefore, who shall confess me before men, him I shall also confess before my Father who is in the heavens. But whoever shall deny me before men, him I shall also deny before my Father who is in the heavens. And Titus 1, verse 16 says, They profess to know Elohim, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unfit for any good work. And here's a picture of several pictures of some men who, some have died, some are still alive, who are famous atheists. You know, we have Dawkins, Isaac Asimov, George Clooney, Brad Pitt, Charles Darwin, William Shatner, Disney and Frank Zappa. Um, yeah, they're, uh, they're men that are real men that have or still exist. And uh, they don't believe that Yahuwah exists, at least at this point. You know. Now, here's the thing. Evolutionists, and everybody will agree that's, that even is a believer, that interpretation of the same facts can lead to different conclusions. If you interpret things incorrectly, all the facts are interpreted. The facts don't change. One observer can look at the same facts and arrive at a different interpretation of those facts. People think there's something going on that's not going on. That's a quote from Adam White. There's something going on that's not going on. 
evolution is what we're showing you is not going on. Now, looking at these two pictures, these are the exact, these are the same picture, but one is upside down. And it looks like a mound or an island or something, you know? See that? It looks like it's something other than what it really is. But when you invert it the other way, it's the same picture. It's a crater. See how interpretation can be easy to, and we can do that in a number of different ways. I mean, optical or, or thought processes, you know. The same facts can be interpreted differently. Flawed presuppositions about history produce errors in interpretation also. Speciation is a big word, and it sounds like whoever would use a word like that must know what they're talking about. That's not necessarily true. The, the uh, scientists understand it a little bit more, but uh, what we have in speciation is the, the species were created to be what they are, and inside them, the, the people who are doing the genome studies are finding that there's all this junk DNA. It's not junk. It's actually created there for a purpose. And here's, I'm gonna point out some of the illustrations of why the stuff is there. It's because adaptations have to be made from pressures that are put on these creatures in order for them to be sustained. But in spite of that, a lot of times the environment does cause extinction. Now the decline in the number of species is a steady trend throughout history. So species are declining every year, and we see it. They're not more being made, and that would be if evolution were true. But um, the proper understanding of the mechanism for genetic expression, now genetic expression means you have this kind of hair or that kind of skin color or eye color or body build or shape or whatever. Um, you have to understand that there's mechanisms that are underlying that in the, in the genetic material that produce those you know, expressions. If a gene is expressed, it means that you have black hair or, or green eyes or whatever. Now, it's uh, adaptation that causes these expressions, not selection, because speciation by way of natural selection is a fairy tale. I know that sounds wild because everybody that's listening to this has been taught that speciation or the pressure on, from the environment on a species causes it to change into something else. <laughs> it's not. It's the, because the environment does not select anything. It's just an inert thing. It doesn't have any way of choosing anything. It doesn't select. That's a bad word. But organisms already contain, in what they call the junk DNA, the information within them for adaptation through genetic trait expression. And here's a picture of a couple of bears, for example. These are bears that are related to each other. One was born black and the other one was born white or light colored, light brown, uh, because gene expression from some environmental pressure not a selection, but pressure, caused an adaptation to occur. And that ultimately happens with polar bears because the polar bear and the black bear are the same bear. It's just that one, when it was hunting for food, being a lighter fur, was able to get closer to its prey and eat and therefore reproduce. And its offspring became lighter and lighter and lighter, exactly like we do when we breed dogs, you know, or looking for genetic traits and we want to make a dog smaller or, or bigger through the offspring, you know. So any, it's genetic, it's trait expression is what it is. And then there's this thing that geneticists, or not geneticists so much, but uh, ge geologists say they've got the geological column all planned out in time. They've got all these millions of years, all stratifications of this creature was back here at this period, and this, then this creature appeared, and this creature appeared. And it wasn't through catastrophism like the flood. It was just, you know, through uniformitarianism where everything was the same all the time, and then these creatures existed, and then then these creatures existed, and then these creatures, that's uniformitarianism. It's a concept that the earth was shaped 
in the form and the pattern of the geological column was laid down by, by gradual processes of the type that are acting today uniformly. And that's not true because it's really catastrophism. The thing that in the, in the geological column that you see in the real world is nothing like this that you see in the books. It is actually possible for you to find a tree going down through all these different layers of supposed ages. You know, it was really only a matter of days or weeks that a lot of these things were laid down. When you're driving down the expressway, you can see the, the rocks that have been dynamited out and you see all these sandy little areas. This stuff was laid down by water. You can see that water churning up and different weights of materials laid these things down uniformly in stratifications. You know, that's a very rapid thing. So reality is different than theory because, you know, and you can, sometimes you can find a tree upside down with its roots up going through all these layers of supposed millions of years. And when, the, <laughs> when a geologist sees some giant tree trunk going down through all these different layers, they just say, well, that doesn't really fit our theories, so we'll just call that an, an, an anomaly and just ignore it and say, that's freaky, that can't happen, you know, because it doesn't fit their observable facts, their interpretation of the facts. See, they, they don't want to see that. So we have two different things. We have uniformitarianism, which is what the evolutionists believe, and then we have catastrophism, which is an old doctrine that they say is now discarded that the earth was created and shaped by sudden divine acts rather than by gradual evolutionary processes. See, that's their definition of catastrophism. Now, the logical conclusion to deny creation, if you deny creation, one also denies the existence of Yahuwah. That's obvious. And to deny the existence of Yahuwah also renounces and overthrows the purpose for which Yahushua shed his blood. Now, Yahushua, you know who he is. If, if you deny Yahuwah exists, then it also denies and renounces and overthrows the purpose for which Yahushua shed his blood. So his blood is not on your, on your heart. To deny the purpose for which Yahushua shed his blood, then we deny the atonement for the sins of the world, and that dog won't hunt, then we're cooked. We have, we're hopeless. Now, if we're uh, going to accept evolution, then we have to also conclude there's going to be a devaluation of human life, our value. You know, and in 1859, Charles Darwin published his Origin of Species. Now, that's the short version of the title, The Origin of Species, as a mechanism you know, for, he called it natural selection. And we, sh we talked about that. Nature did not select anything. It can't. It was the pressures of the environment. You remember? Now, here's the full title. <laughs> this is so racist. On the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Log the logical conclusion of this perspective is that somebody wants to manage the human beings. It's human management. It's a perspective, you know. And uh, we talked about abortion last month and how they seem to be putting the abortion clinics in certain areas where mostly the, the races that they don't approve of will be lessened or even possibly uh, crippled, you know. Communism, as an economic system, was uh, implementing this same theory, you know, only through economic means. In other words, uh, the favored are going to economically succeed, and the unfavorable races are going to naturally be wiped clean from the earth. Now, eugenics is the reproductive control and elimination, because, you see... Uh, Planned Parenthood is a eugenics organization. They don't deny that. And uh, elimination of undesirable traits by extermination. Now, undesirable traits, according to human management, human management. Examples are Nazi Germany, 
or China's limitation on children, and the eugenics organization called Planned Parenthood, and they're global. Now, the presuppositions that people have in their head about things, about the world, will block the discernment of truth because uh, if we just read this text in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it says, And we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from Elohim, in order to know what Elohim has favorably given us, which we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the set-apart spirit teaches, comparing spiritual matters with spiritual matters. But the natural man, the one that does not have the spirit, does not receive the matters of the spirit of Elohim, for they are foolishness to him, and he is unable to know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual discerns indeed all matters, but he himself is discerned by no one. For who has known the mind of Yahuwah? Who shall instruct him? But we have the mind of Messiah. So in darkness, when the minds are foolish and they're darkened, when the mind is darkened, the men love that because they feel very cozy and secure, not knowing anything, until they stop their wickedness and come to the light. Now in John or Yahukun in chapter 3, starting at verse 19, it says, And this is the judgment, this is Yahusha speaking, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their works were wicked. For everyone who is practicing evil matters, hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But the one doing the truth comes to the light so that his works are clearly seen that they have been wrought in Elohim. Now I have a picture down here of uh, the, do the, sc the scroll of the, this is called the Heckel Sefer actually, the shrine of the book. It means a temple of the scroll. You know, the scroll is the Sefer. The scroll of, the great scroll of Isaiah is in there. And there's many other Dead Sea Scrolls in there. And this is not a flying saucer. This is, but this motif is shaped after the top of a scroll jar. When they put the scrolls in retirement, they wouldn't throw it away because they had the name written on them. And they would never throw a document away that had the name written on it. In, in the Dead Sea Scrolls in all those caves, there's a, an enormous number of documents. Some of them are contracts, some of them are letters, and many of them are scripture. Because the name was written on them, they would never throw the document away or destroy it. So they just rolled it up and they put it in, the, in this jar and they put the lid on it and then they put it in the caves. And they did this for centuries. Um, and it was a dry area, so this, they were very well preserved considering, you know. Now, Yahuwah's righteousness will be declared to a people yet unborn. Now, that's talking about us. We were not born yet, and as an atheist, you weren't born yet, but Yahuwah has addressed you. Psalm 22, starting at verse 27, says, Let all the ends of the earth remember and turn to Yahuwah, and all the clans of the nations bow themselves before you, for the rain belongs to Yahuwah, and he is ruling over the nations. All the fat ones of the earth shall eat and bow themselves. All who go down to the dust bow before him, even he who did not keep his alive his own life. A seed shall serve him. It is declared of Yahuwah to the coming generation. They shall come and declare his righteousness to a people yet to be born, for he shall do it. That's it. Yeah. That's what I, I received an email from a brother here in the, in the audience today about this term, asa, you know, at the very end of that verse. Now, Psalm 40, I already had that in the text, by the way, uh, before your email. That was what shocked me so much. Uh, but what? <laughs> Psalm 40, starting at verse 7, says, Then I said, See, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is prescribed for me. I have delighted to do your pleasure, O my Elohim, and your Torah is within my heart. I thought that was a, a great text to have sitting next to that uh, heckle sefer. You know. Now, evolution theory is 
another stronghold. It's a, it's a thought prison. It's a box that people put themselves in and allow themselves to stay in. And it needs to be overthrown, exalting itself against the knowledge of Elohim. That's what it does. It, it exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim. Second Corinthians talks about that in chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not fight according to the flesh. For the weapons we fight with are not fleshly, but mighty in Elohim for overthrowing strongholds, overthrowing reasonings that every high matter that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim, taking captive every thought to make it obedient to the Messiah and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. Believing imaginary nonsense won't make it come true. And the only thing that really is true is the word of Yahuwah. Jeremiah 16, or Yermiyahu 16, says, O Yahuwah, my strength and my stronghold and my refuge, in the day of distress, that's the great tribulation, the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Our fathers have inherited only falsehood, futility, and there is no value in them. Would a man make mighty ones for himself, which are not mighty ones? Therefore, see, I am causing them to know. This time I cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is Yahuwah. Now, when you're an evolutionist, you're putting humanity as your deity. That's what you're doing. You're deifying humanity, and you're trying to manage the world, you know. You have to acknowledge that Yahuwah is in total control, especially when you look up and you see one of those tornadoes. You say, whoa, we're not really in control at all. They don't want us to use Yahuwah's word. When an, when an atheist or an evolutionist confronts one of us, they don't want us to use the word. They want us to put down our weaponry, but we're not. We're going to show them the weaponry. They've had their talk. They've, they've said everything they can say. It's time for them to listen to what Yahuwah says. Don't talk to men. Talk to him. Now, it says um, his word will accomplish what it was sent for. In, in Yeshiahu or Isaiah 55, starting at verse 8, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares Yahuwah. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from the heavens and do not return there, but water the earth and make it br bring forth and bud and give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so is my word that goes forth from my, from my mouth. It does not return to me empty, but shall do what I please and shall certainly accomplish what I sent it for. There was a man, a uh, Christian, I believe, who is named Randy Alcorn. I want to quote him. Uh, and his uh, ministry is called Eternal Perspective Ministries. He says, truth is reality. It's the way things really are. What seems to be and what really is are often not the same. Things are not as they appear. To know the truth is to see accurately. To believe what isn't true is to be blind. Seek and you will find. The truth is actually a person, like I mentioned earlier. Our hearts long for the truth, and that is the person of Yahushua, the spirit of Messiah. Yahushua is the source of all truth. Yahushua himself declared this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's Yahukanan or John chapter 14. And you can ask any atheist this question. What evidence do you have that Yahuwah does not exist? Blind faith, that's what we have here. Uh, in Second Peter, it talks about blind faith. And for this reason, do your utmost to add to your belief, uprightness, to uprightness knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, endurance, to endurance, reverence, to reverence, brotherly affection, and to brotherly affection, love. For if these are in you and increase, 
they cause you to be neither inactive nor without fruit in the knowledge of our master Yahushua Messiah. For he in whom these are, not present, is blind, being short-sighted and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his old sins. So that blindness is, uh, is always there, even in the believer sometimes. 1 Corinthians 13 says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be inactive. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, I reasoned as a child. But when I became a man, I did, did away with childish matters. For now, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know as I also have been known. And now belief, expectation, and love remain, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Now, in Psalm 25, we have the, these words. My eyes are ever toward Yahuwah, for he brings my feet out of the net. Turn your face to me and show me favor, for I am lonely and afflicted. My distress, the distresses of my heart have enlarged. Oh, bring me out of my distresses. Look on my affliction and my toil and forgive all my sins. See how many my enemies have become, and they hate me without, with a violent hatred. Oh, guard my life and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I have taken refuge in you. Let integrity and straightness guard me, for I have waited for you. Redeem Yisrael, O Elohim, out of all his distresses. Now, uh, here's what uh, every atheist has to face, and that is, uh, well, there's, in cosmology, there's three basic theories. The universe is expanding steadily, or increasing in speed, whatever, or it is contracting, or it's steady state. It's just sitting there. <laughs> and it may be infinite, but they don't know if it's open or closed or steady. They don't know. But whatever it is, it's out of our control. And we should say, well, what is it that we should have? Hope or hopelessness? You know. In the Hebrew, the word tekua means a cord or a, blind, or a binding thing, something that, that holds something to something else. It's an anchor rope, you know, a chain. But anyway, it, 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 it actually means hope, you know, something that you can trust in, you know. And it uh, has a positive attribute, and we could look at English words like expectancy, promise, confidence, aim, purpose, optimism, assurance, trust, security, curable, light, courage, reliance, conquer, overcome, success, joy, goal. All those have hopeful, positive attributes. Now, on the, on the other hand, if you want to just stay an atheist and you don't want any of those attributes, then here's the attributes that you're going to have, and they're all negative. Disbelief, despair, doubt, fear, gloom, aimless, discouragement, despondency, incurable, darkness, cowardly, failure, surrender, lose. Those are the attributes of every atheist and every person that doesn't believe you who exists. Now in 1st Yehuchanan 4, starting at verse 5, it says, they are, are of the world. Therefore they speak as of the world and the world hears them. We are of Elohim. <clears throat> the one knowing Elohim hears us. He who is not of Elohim does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of the truth and the spirit of the delusion. Beloved ones, let us love one another because love is of Elohim. And everyone who loves has been born of Elohim and knows Elohim. The one who does not love does not know Elohim, for Elohim is love. By this, the love of Elohim has manifest, was manifested in us that Elohim has sent his only brought forth son into the world in order that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved Elohim, but that he loved us and sent his son to be an atoning offering for our sins. 
Beloved ones, if Elohim so loved us, we ought also to love one another. How powerful is that? Yeah. Now, in, in Yeshayahu or Isaiah 43, it says, we are Yahuwah's witnesses that, we are, that he is El. You are my witnesses, declares Yahuwah, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no El formed, nor after me there is none. I, I am Yahuwah, and besides me there is no Savior, no Deliverer. That's the Hebrew word Yasha, Yasha. I, I have declared and saved and made known, and there was no foreign mighty one among you. And you are my witnesses, declares Yahuwah, that I am El. Hebrews 11.6 reflects that too. But without belief, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to Elohim has to believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Now that's the final word in the matter. That's basically it. If you don't have the belief, if you don't believe that he is, <clears throat> and he's a rewarder of those who seek him, then there's no point. <clears throat> now, dying words, <clears throat> the dying words of a dying person are very important, you know? And if we, if, on the internet, you can watch the dying words of very many people dying of cancer and various things. But Yahusha, when he died, he spoke words that were living words, that were living and active. And uh, they, they give us encouragement. And I'd like to believe that he may have said Asa, but I'm going to suggest that there's a, a word in Greek that we have received that I'm going to show you in just a moment that I'm going to propose. What if he said this? It gave me chills thinking about it. What word did Yahushua speak just before he died for you? Well, let's find out. The, in our translations, we see it is finished or something like that. It's three words or so, but really he only said one word. In the Greek, it says that it was teleo. Teleo is T-E-L-E-O. But we know that he probably wasn't speaking Greek. Um, in John 19.30, it says, So when Yahushua took the sour wine, he said, It has been accomplished. That's the one word. It has been fin it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. <coughs> now we're told that he said it is finished or it is accomplished. The Greek word teleo gives us that. And we might look into the Septuagint translation for that word to see what that word was to those translators. However, they are just translators. Now, what if he did say this word, which means complete, shalom? Now, on those gravestones, in the gravestones that I mentioned in Zura, near Lot's Cave in the southern part of the Dead Sea, the bottom part of all the epitaphs, or many of the epitaphs, say shalom upon Israel, shalom. And that is so powerful. Now, those are the last words of some dying person, or at least the person that wrote the epitaph. Now, what if that is true? And if he, if he yelled out with his last dying gasp, Shalom, how powerful is that? Now, that would mean that our sins were discharged, you know, because that's the same thing as the stamp you put on a contract that says paid in full, you know. Now, the Nazarene, that's who we are, we guard two primary things, and that is the name of Yahuwah and the word of Yahuwah. And it says in Psalm 138, I bow myself towards your set-apart heckel, your temple, and give thanks to your name for your kindness and for your truth. For you have made great your word, your name, above all. In number six, it says, Speak to Aharon and to his son, saying, This is how you are to bless the children of Israel. Those are the ones in the covenant. Yahuwah bless you and guard you. Yahuwah make his face shine upon you and show favor to you. Yahuwah lift up his face upon you and give you 
Shalom.